Father, we're grateful for this morning and uh, grateful for your, the birth of your son into our world that we are going to be celebrating this week. And I just ask that uh, amongst a lot of different things that are always competing for our attention, that uh, today at Sugarland Bible Church, from beginning to end, uh, that our focus would be on Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and that we're here for him and to speak about him and to think about him and to worship him. And so help us to do that today. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. amen. Well, good morning and almost Merry Christmas. Uh, I don't think we have a handout today, sorry. Um, partly because we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, I've entitled this a Christmas Convergence, and there's so much here, it's going to take me two sessions to do it, so this is going to be a part one, and in the main service we'll do part two. You guys being here for part one puts you light years ahead of those people that are com coming in just for the worship service, they're going to wonder, what are they talking about? What's going on? So praise the Lord that you're here. Um, but we are, we talk a lot today about what's called prophetic convergence. In fact, there's, a, I think there's a video or a movie out there done by Christians on prophetic convergence. <clears throat> and basically what they're talking about is all of, all of the end time prophecies that are sort of coming together in our generation. And so it's a fascinating study to look at all the things that are happening today. <clears throat> the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're not talking about the signs related to the second coming of Christ. We're talking about the signs related to what? The first coming of Christ, because when Christ came into the world the first time, in what we called the first advent, there was a similar prophetic convergence taking place. In other words, when Jesus was born into this world, God was bringing together, just like he's doing right now, in preparation for the second coming, he was bringing together a strand of prophetic threads coming together simultaneously, which are und were undeniable. And this is one of the things that makes Jesus unique. People say, well, why are you a Christian? Why not just worship uh, some other deity? Well, one of the things that makes Jesus unique is there's a fact going for him. In fact, there's several facts. But there is a fact going for him that no other human being that's ever walked the face of the earth has had going for him, and that is his life was revealed in a script called Bible Prophecy, and that script was written hundreds and in some cases thousands of years before Jesus ever walked the face of this earth. And you can follow me around. We've got a lot of scriptures to look at, but over in, follow me around in the Bible, not physically. <laughs> We're not into stalking. We're not a stalking church, right? But over in Luke 24, verse 27, Jesus on the Emmaus Road made reference to this prophetic convergence. He said, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained, to the th he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, what scriptures would those be? Well, there wasn't a New Testament written at that point. So he's talking about Hebrew Bible. And he's making the point that the whole thing points to me. Uh, I don't know of any other historical figure that could make that type of claim. And when you drop down to Luke 24, verse 44, it said, says this, Now he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
And what he's doing there is he's giving the outline of Hebrew Bible, what we sometimes call Old Testament. And he's explaining what is called Tanakh, T, Torah, N, Nabim, or prophets, K, Kethabim, or writings, abbreviated Tanakh. And he basically is saying the whole thing is about me. The whole thing points to me. And he is uh, <clears throat> explaining these things to the disciples as they're walking on the Emmaus Road. Now, of all of the sermons of Jesus that I wish I could be a fly on the wall for, that, that would probably be my pick. I mean, I couldn't even imagine, could you imagine walking with Jesus on the Emmaus Road and he's explaining to them that Hebrew Bible all points towards him? Over in John 5, verse 39 and verse 46, we read these words, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these, the scriptures, Tanakh, Hebrew Bible, the only scripture that was available at that point, it is these scriptures that testify about me. Then he says in verse 46 of John 5, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. In other words, if you're reading Hebrew Bible and you're not seeing Jesus or the Hebrew name for Jesus, Yeshua, in Hebrew Bible, you don't understand Hebrew Bible because it's designed by God to reveal the history of Jesus in advance. And this became one of the... Um, tools that the Apostle Paul used to evangelize the lost. This is what we read in Acts 17, verses 1 through 3. This is Paul's second missionary journey. Now, when they had traveled through uh, Amph, Amph, I can't even pronounce that, Amphipolis, I guess, and Opaliana, pardon the bad pronunciation, they came to Thessalonica, now you say, well, he finally pronounced a word right. Actually, when I was in Thessalonica, they all talked about it as Thessaloniki. So I can't even get the pronunciation right on this. But it looks to me like Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So Paul's going to evangelize the Jews. How do you evangelize the Jews? Paul explains here, or Luke explains by showcasing Paul's ministry. It says, and according to Paul's custom... He went to them for three Sabbaths, that'd be three weeks, and reasoned them from the scriptures. Now, what scriptures are those? That's the only scripture available at this time, Hebrew Bible. Explaining and giving evidence, notice that, evidence, that the Christ had to, not was supposed to or could have, but had to, Suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, "This is whom I am proclaiming. To you. This whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ." So Paul was a believer in Bible prophecy, prophetic convergence, and he used that as part of his evangelism for the Jews as proof. And so you might think about that sometime when you're evangelizing people. Uh, one of the great proofs of the Bible is the fact that it reveals history in advance. No other alleged holy book does this. So there are probably around 109 specific prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ's first coming. That's a lot of prophecies. And let me tell you something, Jesus held his generation, particularly the religious leaders, accountable for understanding these prophecies. He says this in Matthew 16, verse 3, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times? So you know how to figure out weather patterns, red sky in the morning, what? What? Sailor, take warning, but you don't even understand the prophetic season that you're in right now related to my first coming. You don't even understand the prophetic convergence that's happening all around you. Uh, I have a quote here from Peter Stoner. 
Uh, let me just give you his credentials. In 1969, Peter Stoner published a book called Science Speaks. Dr. Stoner was the chairman of the departments of mathematics and astronomy at Pasadena City College until 1953 when he became chairman of the science division at Westmont College. In other words, he was a capable mathematician, and in his book, Science Speaks, Dr. Stoner calculated the probability that any one man could fulfill just eight prophecies. Forget the 109. Let's just focus on eight. He said there would be a chance in one in 10 to the 17th power, meaning one a one with 17 zeros after it. I guess a 10, with, yeah, one with 17 zeros after it. To illustrate how unlikely a chance that would be, Stoner gave this illustration. You guys will like this since uh, we're living in Texas, amen? In fact, I'm pretty convinced um, that Paul probably could not have been a Texan <laughs> because Paul said he was content no matter what state he was in, so... Can't be a Texan. But Stoner gave this illustration, covered the entire state of Texas with silver dollars to a level of two feet deep. The total number of silver dollars needed would be 10 to the 17th power. Now choose just one silver dollar and mark it and put it back, then thoroughly stir up all the silver dollars all over the state, big state. Now blindfold someone and tell them they can travel wherever they want in Texas, but sometimes they must pick up, they must pick up one of the silver dollars, the one that's marked in other words. The chance of finding that silver dollar that we marked in a pile two feet deep covering the state of Texas would be the chance that the prophets had for just eight prophecies coming true in one man in the future let alone 109 prophecies. And one of the reasons I enjoy this subject so much is because we've been studying the book of, books of Daniel, the books of Revelation, and we're kind of looking at these things and we're wondering, are these things really going to take place on planet Earth? And God sort of anticipated that we would have this question, so he gave us a track record called Prophecy. And he said, all of my other prophecies have come to pass literally and accurately. There was a prophetic convergence around the first coming of Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't switch horses in midstream. Why would all of a sudden we think that the rest of the prophecies in the Bible will never happen? It's kind of like me up here. Let's pretend I'm on a basketball court and I make, you know where the free throw line is, right? Uh, 15 feet from the basket, and let's say I make nine free throws in a row. Now, my coaches would be stunned <laughs> if I did that because they would say, you couldn't do that 30 years ago. But uh, let's pretend I made nine free throws in a row. Then I say, well, do you think I can make the 10th one? And you would probably say yes because you have a track record. And that's what you have in the Bible. I mean, you have all of these prophecies that came to pass in Jesus' first coming, so why wouldn't the prophecies yet to come as we're studying in Revelation and Daniel also not come to pass with equal precision and accuracy? You say, well, what does this have to do with Christmas? It has everything to do with Christmas. Because the book of Galatians says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Jesus was dropped into history at the exact right moment in time for a prophetic convergence to take place where th scattered themes in the Bible are simultaneously coming together in a human being. So since this is Christmas, what I'd like to walk through and maybe if We've got a lot of grace from the Lord. We can finish one and two or one and three in the first session and then the remaining in the sermon that follows. But we're going to be looking at five prophecies that have come to pass in the person of Jesus Christ related to his birth. 
We're not even looking at eight prophecies. We're certainly not looking at 109. We're just looking at five. And these are things that we ought to be thinking about because we're celebrating the general holiday when we celebrate the birth of Jesus. When Jesus was born into this world, he was stepping out of eternity into time and he was fulfilling a preordained script. And that script was written hundreds and thousands of years before the virgin conception or virgin birth of Christ. So here we go. Let's, and follow me over if you could, to Genesis 3, verse 15, the first prophecy. And probably the main takeaway from it is the Messiah must be a man. So we're living in this sort of gender neutral culture where you can't say man and woman anymore. You have to respect people based on how they identify, whatever that means. And so it's interesting to me that the Bible is very gender specific. The Bible says when the Messiah comes, he will not be a woman, he will be a man. So look, if you will, at Genesis 3 verse 15, which I would take as the first messianic prophecy in the whole Bible. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, but you shall bruise him on the heel. So the fall of man has happened, Genesis 3. The plan of redemption is now announced. And we know that there's coming one from the seed of the woman. Who's the woman? Eve. Who is going to take the serpent's head. Who is the serpent? Satan and crush it. So there is what's called the proto-evangelium or the first proclamation of the gospel really found in the whole, world, uh, whole scripture. So there's a lot of things to think about when you think about Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Number one, is this really a messianic prophecy? Because I'm sorry to announce that the trend in evangelicalism today amongst scholars is to deny this and several other prophecies as messianic in nature. So they want to make this about how, you know, women today are naturally fearful of snakes and all of these sort of strange interpretations that have nothing to do with Jesus. And yet... Eve knew exactly who this prophecy was talking about. This is what Eve said when her firstborn came into the world, Cain. Genesis 4 verse 1 says, Now the man had relations with Eve, and she conceived, and she gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have begotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now, I'm quoting there from the New American Standard Bible. Do you see how with the help of or the help of is italicized there? What does that mean when you're reading a Bible translation and it's in italics? Well, what it means is the translators supplied that meaning to kind of, you know, take care of some rough edges. I mean, it's, it's hard to go from Hebrew into someone's known language. There's gonna be some rough spots, some awkwardness. So to kind of smooth out the awkwardness, the translators will supply some words. And the translators, quite frankly, do a very good job most of the time. But this is an, an instance where I think the translators have obscured the meaning of the passage. Because if you want to understand what Eve is saying with the birth of Cain, all you do is remove the words with the help of. That makes the passage read as follows. I have begotten a man child, skip with the help of, I have begotten a man child, the Lord. That's literally what, the way it reads in Hebrew. I have begotten a man child, the Lord. So she thought Cain was the fulfillment of the prophecy related to the Messiah. Sounds like a typical parent, right? You think your own child is the Messiah. Uh, talk about parental disappointment. Uh, this guy was not the Messiah. He turned out to be the world's first murderer. But she thought he was the Messiah. That's what she thought when he 
came forth. So where did she get the idea that from her body could come the Messiah? Well, she obviously got it from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Because she was right there in Eden when this prophecy was spoken. So clearly, if you want to take Eve's perspective on it, Genesis 3, verse 15 is messianic. And then what happens is you, you get a long genealogy in Genesis 5, and everybody's naming everybody. Parents are naming their children. And you run into this guy named Lamech. Lamech has a son named Noah. And this is what Lamech said about Noah as Noah was being born. Or was born. Now he called his name Noah saying, This one will give us rest from the work, from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. And what he is saying in Genesis 5 verse 29 at the birth of Noah is this one is going to reverse the curse. Because when you take that word curse and you back up to Genesis 3 verse 17, which comes right after Genesis 3 verse 15, God says you shall not eat from it, speaking of the original command, you shall not eat from it. And he said, cursed is the ground because of you. So God says, you rebel against me. Okay, then nature itself is going to rebel against you. So eking out a living is going to become difficult. And so when Lamech is there and Noah is being born, Lamech thinks that his son is the Messiah. This, this is the guy that's going to reverse the curse. Now again, more parental disappointment because it was Noah, as you know, who did great things for God but found himself drunk uh, in the post-flood world, etc. So he was no Messiah. In fact, the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You don't need grace if you're a Messiah, right? But my point is Lamech had this idea that there was coming one from his lineage that would reverse the curse. Now, where did Lamech get this idea? He got it from the same place Eve got it. Genesis 3, verse 15, a promise that had been faithfully passed down to the generations through oral tradition. And this helps us understand Daniel chapter 11, verse 37, about the Antichrist. Daniel says of the Antichrist, he will show no regard for the gods of his father or the desire of women. Now, you wouldn't believe what the commentators do with that prediction. Oh, the Antichrist is going to be homosexual or whatever, and that has nothing to do with it at all. When it talks about the Antichrist not showing a regard for the desire of women, he's referring to the desire of every Jewish woman, going back to Eve, to be the one that would bear, whose womb would bring forth the Messiah. And as we know, that honor ultimately fell to Mary, the mother of Christ in the New Testament. But that's what the desire of women is. It's the Messiah. So when it says he will show no regard for the gods of his father or for the desire of women, he's saying the Antichrist will show no regard for the Messiah who was the desire of women or the desire of Jewish women. In other words, to be the mother of that Messiah. So this desire of women is something that's linked all the way back to Eve. And Eve got the idea from a messianic interpretation of Genesis 3, verse 15. So very clearly, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in my opinion, is a messianic prophecy. And that particular prophecy reveals the gender of the Messiah. Because Genesis 3, verse 15 says, you shall bruise, what? Him on the heel. The Messiah is going to be a man. Now, here's something very else, else that's very interesting about Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I believe that this is the first virgin birth prophecy in the Bible. 
In the second session, I'll be showing you the other virgin birth prophecy, Isaiah 7, verses 13 and 14. But long before Isaiah came about and God gave Isaiah the prophecy about the virgin birth, the virgin birth is already predicted in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's just not as clear. Why do I say that? Notice what it says. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, now speaking of Eve, and her seed. That should strike you as strange. Because the woman doesn't have the seed. The seed is the sperm that belongs to the man. So why in the world would it say her seed and not her husband's seed? Because what's going to happen to her is something supernatural. Outside the normal ordering of things is going to be planted into her, or at least her lineage. And just so you th don't think I've gone completely bonkers with my interpretations, I'm quoting a lot from here Arnold Fruchtenbaum and his book, Messianic Christology, which I would recommend to you. He says, the fact that Moses, Genesis 3, verse 15, traced this lineage through the woman tells us that there will be something very different about the Messiah, something that necessitates tracing his ancestry through his mother, not his father. Moses gives no explanation and none will be given for several centuries until the time of the prophet Isaiah, he will prophesy in chapter 7 that, Moses, that Messiah is to be born of a virgin and not a human father. Contrary to the biblical norm, the Messiah would be reckoned after the seed of the woman. Why? Because he will have no human father. He would be a virgin conception and birth. So Genesis 3 verse 15, if I'm understanding this correctly, gives you really two pieces of critical information about the birth of Christ. Number one, he will be a man. Number two, he will be born of a virgin. And would you say the virgin birth is an important doctrine? Sadly, what's happening, not in liberal circles but within so-called evangelical circles, is people are marginalizing, if not outright denying, the necessity of the virgin birth. Uh, here's a quote from Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley is the son of Charles Stanley, who you've watched probably on television. I like Charles Stanley, but I wish he had spent a little bit more time mentoring the theology of his son because Andy Stanley has said some things that to me are indefensible and inexplicable. Andy Stanley, the last time someone made me aware of numbers, has the largest church, if not one of the largest churches in the, in the whole United States, if not the world. And here's what Andy Stanley says, and you can find this quote, I've got the source there. And it's a lengthy quote, so I won't give you the whole thing. You can read through it on your own, just to make sure I'm not misrepresenting him. But he says, maybe the thought is that they were to come up with some myth about the birth of Christ to give him, that's Jesus, some street cred later on. And he's trying to develop this as a potential explanation for what the Bible reveals concerning the virgin birth. And then he makes this unbelievable statement. He says, Christianity does not hinge on the truth or even the stories about the virgin birth. It's really about the resurrection of Jesus. So if you've got the resurrection down, that's all you need to know. Nothing to see here, folks. Move right along. Virgin birth. Don't build your house on that doctrine. Uh, Brian McLaren said this recently, whether you believe the virgin birth story or not, McLaren said, it's literal factuality is not the point. 
So that's not the point of the story, giving you literal history about the virgin birth of the Messiah. Well, what's it about, Brian? Well, it's about patriarchy. McLaren concluded that the virgin birth is about a profound rejection of violence. The notion that peace can never come through the old blood-stained path of patriarchy. Aha, so it's about men suppressing women. I knew that was the meaning. Well, folks, that's heretical to say something like that. It's, it's, it's equally bad to sort of deny it as well as marginalize it and make it sound like it's not that big of a deal. Because if you don't have the virgin birth, it's like dominoes in a row. You knock over a domino, they're all going to fall. And here are some doctrines that are denied if you have no virgin birth, historically and literally. You deny Old Testament prophecy. You deny the humanity of Christ alongside his deity. We call that the hypostatic union, the two natures of Christ. Because at the virgin conception, humanity was added alongside eternally existent deity. You deny the fact that Christ was eternal. Because if Christ had had a normal conception, he had a beginning point. I have a beginning point, as do you, but Christ is eternal. He has always existed, and so it was necessary for God to bring him into the world, not through a normal conception. And if there's no virgin birth, and Jesus was naturally born into this world, what did he inherit? A sin nature. That's why all of us have a sin nature, because of Adam's curse, so to speak, passed down to us genetically. Not Jesus. Because he wasn't in Adam's line. Why not? The miracle of the virgin conception. And if Jesus was not sinless, then he can't qualify to be our atonement because the sacrificial lamb must be what? Unblemished, spotless, perfect. And if you deny the virgin birth and you put Jesus under the curse of Jeconiah, Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30, God put a curse on Jeconiah's line. And guess who's in the lineage leading to Joseph? You'll see it in Matthew 1, Jeconiah. So how did God get Jesus out of the curse of Jeconiah? He gave him a legal father, but not a biological father in Joseph. How did God do that? That's what the virgin birth is about. And if you're going to walk around and you want the title pastor, and you're going to walk around telling people in the largest church in America that the virgin birth, that Christianity doesn't hang on the virgin birth, then you might as well just take the Bible and just take white out to all the virgin birth sections in the New Testament. So that never happened. To be frank with you, folks, I don't know how people that say these kinds of things are leaders of any church anywhere and have any kind of following and have any title at all as representatives of Christianity because they're not espousing Christian truth. They're they're rewriting the Bible that they ought to be advocating and defending and promoting. The mainline liberal liberal groups did did this 100 years ago. And now what you see is mainstream evangelicals starting to sound kind of like the liberals that we all separated from. So the virgin birth is a big deal. And the first time you see the virgin birth spelled out is in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, revealing his virgin birth and revealing his gender. Let's go to a second prophecy. Follow me over, if you could, to Numbers 24, verse 17. Prophecy number two is that the Messiah, when he is born into the world, must be born from Jacob's lineage. He's got to be a descendant of not just Abraham, not just Isaac, but also Jacob. Now, here's what's on all your Christmas cards, right? We've seen that before. I like what it says there at the bottom, wise men still seek him. But we've got these magi coming from the east, following a star, 
to pay homage to the newborn king. And we all know the story, but most of us have no, no explanation as to why these people from that part of the world would be seeking a star at a given time in history. Um, Matthew 2, 1 and 2 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So why are these Easterners following a star at this particular time in history? And the reason this is not on the Christmas cards is the explanation is too long to fit on a Christmas card. And most people just want to read the card and move on. They don't want to digest theology. So, so that I'm not bashing the Christmas card industry. But first of all, where is the East? Matthew 2 verse 1 says these folks came from the East. Where is the East? Well, you do a word study on East, whether it's the Garden of Eden whether it's the Tower of Babel, and you'll always see the east is connected with an area called Mesopotamia, which in Greek means between the rivers. Meso, middle, Potamia you recognized as in Potomac, between the rivers. And what two rivers would we be talking about? The Euphrates and the Tigris. That's where these folks came from. So they came from the east, following a star. Now, why were they doing that? Well, you've got to go back into Messianic prophecy to get this kind of explanation. You have to go back to the Mosaic time period. This would be 1,500 years before Jesus ever lived. Or before the virgin conception took place, I should say, before he walked on this earth. And you know the story in the book of Numbers. The children of Israel had come out of Egyptian bondage. They had passed to the Red Sea. They got to what is called Mount Sinai. They received the law of God at Mount Sinai and they are making their way up, up north, around to the east in an area called the Transjordan. And as they're doing that, they're poised to enter the promised land as God is dealing with the different generations of Israel. There's two generations here, but that's the general trajectory. And as the nation of Israel is going into the east, into the Transjordan, there's a territory there, you see it on the map, called Moab. And Moab, the king of Moab, a guy named Balak, does not like these Jews, these Hebrews, coming through his territory. So Balak hires Balaam. I like to call him a prophet for prophet. (laughs) To curse the Jews. I want these people cursed. And the problem is, every time Balaam tried to curse the Jews, what came out of his mouth? A blessing. And so you'll see these blessings in what is called Balaam's oracles. In Numbers 23 and 24, there are seven oracles here. And you know that there are seven oracles here because as you read those chapters, you'll see this phrase seven times. He took up his oracle and he said. So every time it says that, you know you're into a new oracle. So this is Balak hiring Balaam to curse the Jews and he tried but what came out of his mouth was a blessing. And it's a, it's, they're fascinating to read through. Our interest though is in the fourth one. Because in the fourth one he says something very interesting that looks awfully messianic to me. And part of that fourth one is Numbers 24 verse 17 which you have your Bibles open to. And this is the oracle. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star. Oh my goodness, a star. That sounds familiar. That sounds like Christmas card territory. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall arise from, what does it say? 
Israel, and he shall crush through the foreheads of Moab. The Moabites were the ones hassling Israel as they were entering the land. And tear down all the sons of Sheth. Uh, Sheth. So you'll notice here, number one, a scepter. That's a ruler. Sounds messianic to me. Where is this scepter going to come from? Specifically says it's going to come from Jacob. So the Messiah, when he comes into the world, will not just be born through Abraham's lineage. Ishmael's descendants are Abraham's lineage too, and no Messiah came from them. He will also come from the lineage of Isaac, and he will also come from the lineage of Jacob. And when you've got a lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you've got a he, what we call a Hebrew, or the Jewish race. In fact, Jacob's name was changed to what in the book of Genesis? Israel, Genesis 32, Genesis 35. You'll read those chapters and you'll see it. So here we're told that this scepter is coming forth from the nation of Israel. And then there's another clue here because it analogizes this coming of this scepter through Israel to a star. Now here's the thing to understand. Where was Balaam's hometown? Anybody know? It was in the east. It was in Babylon. We know that because that's what it says. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 4, recounting this event, they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of, what's our word there? Mesopotamia, which means where? Between the rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, sometimes called Mesopotamia, sometimes in Hebrew called Shinar. That's where Abraham, uh, not Abraham, excuse me, that's where Balaam, that's where his residence was. So why are these guys 1,500 years later following this star looking for a Messiah? The answer is very simple. They had access, these magi, to this prophecy. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that they were aware of this prophecy. It was given by one of their own in their home area. And it was passed down through the generations. And this group coming from the east knew about a star. They knew about a scepter coming from the Hebrew nation. And they do that for 1,500 years. Now, let me throw another monkey wrench into this. We go to the time of Daniel. That would be a good seven to eight centuries later. In the book of Daniel, where were the Jews taken into captivity? An area called Shinar, which is where? Between the Euphrates and the Tigris, Mesopotamia, an area that we call Babylonia. Now, do you remember what happened to Daniel when he was taken there as a teenager? He was exported, along with others, 350 miles to the east of Babylon. And in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he tells Daniel, don't just give me the, how would you like this as a job description? Don't just give me the interpretation of the dream, but tell me what the dream was. That'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? Because at least if you, you know, have the dream, you can kind of fake your way through the interpretation, I guess. But how do you explain what the dream originally was? So in order for Daniel to receive this information, he had to have knowledge from God. And he got it. And he gave Nebuchadnezzar there, Daniel 2, an interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was so impressed by what Daniel did that he elevated him, Daniel 2, verse 48, to the chief, the status of chief prefect, prefect over all the, what does it say? Wise man of Babylon. So this is, I think, an early 600 years in advance, an early version of what today we, what was later known as the Magi. Daniel was part of that group there in Babylon. In fact, he was the head over that group. 
And as you continue to read the book of Daniel, what you discover is Daniel has an amazing prophecy in Daniel 9 verse 25 where he talks about the exact day when the Messiah is going to present his credentials to the Jewish nation. He pinpoints it to the exact day. We've done a lot of teaching on this and so I can't, for the sake of time, go back into that, but On our sermon archives in the book of Daniel, you'll discover we were studying the 70 weeks prophecy for about as long as the prophecy itself. 70 weeks, we give you every detail on that. It's it's one of the most fascinating prophecies in the whole Bible because it tells you the exact day Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey proclaiming his messianic credentials. And that's why when he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he said, if you had known in this day, Why would he say that? Because the exact day that they were experiencing was happening right in front of their faces. So these magi coming from the east, following a star at a particular time in history, had access, there's no doubt in my mind, They had access to Daniel's prophecy, because Daniel was one of their own 600 years earlier, and they had access to Balaam's prophecy of the star, because Balaam's hometown was Mesopotamia. And these magi coming from the east said, we know about the star, Numbers 24, verse 17, and we also know about the prophecy of the 70 weeks, and we know the general time period that the Messiah is going to show up, it's about now, the clock is about run, and so when we see this star in the east, we're interested in that, and we're going to follow it, so that we could go to the land of Israel, 350 miles to the west, and pay homage to the king, because we know that the nation of Israel is going to begat the Messiah. And you see, the pagans in Babylon could put these things together. God's own people who had a far fuller revelation were not putting things together. And so it, Matthew is sort of a rebuke, if you will, to the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation, can't even, they, they know the weather, but they can't even figure out what season they're in. They can't even figure out who their Messiah is when he's standing right under their nose, but the pagans have it figured out based on just two prophecies without a completed canon. And so there's a few in early Judaism that are searching for the Messiah. Simeon was in Luke 2.25. Anna was in Luke 2.36 through 38. Simeon, Luke 2.25, Anna, Luke 2.36-38. So there's a few people that are putting things together, waiting for the Messiah, but most of Israel really could care less. The Jewish leaders couldn't even care. In fact, the only thing the leadership wanted to do was hold on to power. And they only got interested in these messianic prophecies when another king in the neighborhood showed up that was going to buck the power structure. So Israel can't figure it out, but the pagans in Babylon of all places, the worst of the worst, have got it all figured out from two, just two scattered prophecies. And so of course the application is wise men still seek him. Today, which of these two groups represents you? I mean, are you one of those people that's just too busy to be annoyed with messianic prophecy about the end of the, end of the age? Or are you following what clues God has given you to seek the Messiah? So we've only looked at here two prophecies. Genesis 3 verse 15, he must be a man. Number two, he must come from Jacob's line. Now let me give you one more. And this I think, believe it or not, I can do fast. Look at the book of Malachi for just a minute. Very last book in our organization of Hebrew Bible, Malachi chapter three, verse one. I sometimes used to call him Malachi, the only Italian, but. 
Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. So this takes us to a third clue. The Messiah must come before A.D. 70. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Notice what it says. Behold, I am going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will come suddenly to his temple. See that? And the messenger of the covenant in which you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord. Now, the numbers prophecy, 1,500 years in advance. The Genesis 3 verse 15 prophecy goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And now we have a prophecy given probably about I would say 400 years in advance. The United States of America is only 243 years old. So this is almost double in length the duration of the existence of the United States of America. And yet God, through the prophet Malachi, in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, 400 years in advance, says that when the Messiah comes, he's coming where? The Lord is coming to his temple. Now, which temple would this be? In Judaism, there's four temples. Two past, two future. The first temple was built by Solomon. In Kings and Chronicles, you can read about it. It, it started to be built in the year 966 BC. And you'll find that date in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And that temple was the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. Then the nation of Israel went into the 70 year captivity. That's when Daniel had his prophecies into Babylon. They came out of the captivity 70 years later and they started working on Temple 2 which is the temple that you read about in Ezra chapters one through six. And that, in essence, is what the ministries of Haggai and Zechariah are about. You'll find the names Haggai and Zechariah by name in Ezra five, verse one, to motivate the children of Israel to get busy with temple number two and get that thing built. Because they were facing a lot of problems in that post-exilic era when they came back from Babylon. And when you face problems in life, you just sort of quit on things, right? Well, the Jews, the Hebrews were just like that. And so God raises up Haggai and Zechariah to get them motivated to, to build Temple 2. So they started working on Temple 2. And when it got finished, the old men who remembered the Solomonic Temple started to cry because it was so minuscule compared to what they once had. The younger guys didn't know any better. They thought it was great. But the older guys knew better because they could remember the Solomonic temple. And over the course of time, you have references like John 2 verse 20 where Herod, you know, sort of takes that temple and beautifies it and makes it something very attractive at the time of Christ and so that's the temple we're talking about. We're talking about temple number two. And this is the temple that Jesus is interacting with in his ministry and in his life in fulfillment of Malachi chapter three, verse one. So you remember Jesus as a child was taken into the temple and he was confounding the, the wise men of Israel with his knowledge. You remember Jesus driving out the money changers out of that temple. I think he did that twice. Once at the beginning of his ministry and once again at the end. This was the temple that Satan took him to the pinnacle of, you remember? Luke 4, Matthew 4, and said, throw yourself off. Now what happened to that temple? It was destroyed by the Romans in which year? AD 70, historical fact. In fact, Jesus predicted the destruction of that temple. The disciples there in Matthew 24, verse 1, came out from the temple 
And they began to point out how beautiful the thing was. Because Herod had done a pretty good job renovating it. And you'll see this in Luke 21. They're, all, they're very proud of this temple. And Jesus, not being very PC, says the whole thing's going to be torn apart brick by brick. Referring to AD 70. In fact, Jesus said the same thing in Luke 19, verse 44, in reference to temple number two. They, the Romans, will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You weren't paying attention to prophecy. You weren't paying attention to the script. So now... I've been rejected by this nation. This nation is about to come under the disciplinary hand of God. And part of that disciplinary hand of God will be the destruction of temple number two, which y'all are so proud of. Now, we know from extra biblical writings like Josephus that in the events of AD 70 at the hands of the Romans, where over a million Jews lost their lives. In fact, in these verses, you'll see an eerie description of exactly what Josephus describes, a barricade built around Jerusalem where the Jews couldn't get out. And exactly what Jesus said would happen, happened 40 years later. And the temple caught on fire and the gold in the temple began to melt and it oozed down in between the bricks and it dried there. And what do you think the Roman soldiers did to get their hands on the gold? They took it apart brick by brick. In fact, when you go to Israel today, you can see what used to be a temple, the stones taken apart brick by brick, an archaeological remain of it, exactly like Jesus said. And you say, well, what's the point? The point is what you have in Malachi 3 verse 1 is a timing passage. The Messiah has to come prior to A.D. 70 because historically we know through hindsight that the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. You can't come to a temple that doesn't exist anymore. You see that? So I realize hindsight is 2020, but when you step back and look what the Holy Spirit has revealed here concerning the coming of the Messiah to the temple 400 years in advance through the prophet Malachi, you see in God a date a general date for the time period of the Messiah. Now, one other quick thing is you have to understand about the ministry of Jesus, his genealogy is a big deal. Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1, goes to great pains to genealogically identify who Yeshua or Jesus is. It connects him to the tribe of Judah. It connects him to David's lineage. And it connects him ultimately back to Abraham. Now let me ask you a basic question. Where did they store the genealogical records? In the temple. So if Jesus had come after the temple had been destroyed, how would he have ever proven to anybody that wanted to know, his genealogical pedigree. You see that? And so Malachi 3 verse 1 is huge because it says when he comes, he's got to come to his temple. And we know that the reason he has to have some sort of awareness of the temple, access of the temple, is that's where the genealogical records were. All those names that you read about in Matthew 1. And if those are, are wiped out, if those aren't in existence, how can the Messiah ever refer to or def defend his genealogical pedigree. So these, this is what I would call a prophetic convergence. Genesis 3 verse 15, he's got to be a man and born of a virgin. Numbers 24 verse 17, he's got to come from Jacob's line. And that's why the Babylonians are following a star. Number three, he's got to appear before AD 70 and in the next session, we'll do two more. Isaiah 7, verses 13 and 14, and then, and then one you know very well, which is equally mind-boggling. Micah 5, uh, verse 
too. And keep in mind what Dr. Stoner said. In order just for eight prophecies to come into existence in one person, it's one in 10 to the 17th power. And here we're talking about just five prophecies, not even eight, not even 109. And I've selected these because they relate to his birth, which is what we're celebrating this week. So as you celebrate the birth of Christ this week, you need to be thinking about this script that God has given his uh, history in advance. So we'll pick it up in the next session. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this particular time of the year and the things that we're supposed to be thinking about. There's so many profound things in your word that we're so busy we don't even give a moment's thought to. And so help us to really dive into the subject today uh, as we think about the birth of Jesus into our world. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. God's people said, amen.